you, Lord, for the grace in which we stand. That, Lord, you said in Romans 5, 1, that being justified, amen, by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And that we stand, we have access, and we stand into this grace. The grace which is the undeserved, unmerited favor of God. The undeserved, unearned blessings. And we cannot earn even the tiniest, smallest blessing. It all comes through your grace. Can you say amen? Come on, lift a hand with me. Lift a hand with me. Don't, don't disengage. Let's engage in the spirit right now. What the spirit of the Lord wants to do in the midst of his people. He wants to move in ways that we don't even know. He wants to move in ways we have not even imagined. He wants to move in ways that we haven't even planned. But he has plans for us. He wants to do things for us. He wants to move in new ways in your life. Hallelujah. In miraculous ways. He wants to move those mountains out of the way. Those things that have been in your way for so long, God says, like that, in a moment I can move it out of the way. He's going to touch every area of your life today. As you look to him, he says there's nothing impossible. Nothing is impossible with God. And we thank you today, Father, that you've given us that grace. Lord, that you've given us, Lord, the undeserved love of God the unconditional love of Jesus. And we pray that we would be, Lord, recipients that could receive. Say, I receive. I receive. Say, I receive it all. Because it's only through the blood of Jesus. Say it with me. It's only through the blood of Jesus. Say it again. It's only through the blood of Jesus that I can receive what God has for me in this hour. It's not by might. It's not by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. Oh, I feel that wonderful anointing of the Holy Spirit right now. I feel that anointing. I pray that every person within the sound of my voice will feel the anointing of the Holy Spirit today. Lord, that anointing that destroys every yoke of bondage, that anointing that lifts every burden that anointing that breaks every chain. That anointing that causes us to be raised up out of the dunghill, and out of the trash heap, that we might be set among princes. For the pillars of the earth are the Lord's, and he has set the world upon them, First Samuel 2, 8 says. Hallelujah. In Nehemiah 4, 10, they tried to mock the work of God that was taking place. And the enemy said, are you going to take these stones that have been thrown away, that have been discarded, that have been rejected, that are damaged and been burned into the fire? Are you going to use these stones to build again the walls around your people, around your temple? These stones that are being taken up out of the trash heap, out of the rubbish, are you going to use those stones? And the Lord says, yes. Hallelujah. Yes. Hallelujah. I'm going to use those stones that man has rejected. For even Jesus is the key, chief cornerstone. That the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. <laughs> this is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day the Lord has made, and we will rejoice and be glad in it. Yeah. Hallelujah. 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 Say hallelujah. hallelujah. Shout hallelujah. hallelujah. Shout hallelujah. hallelujah. Come on, you're a living stone. Shout hallelujah. hallelujah. God's taking us out of the rubbish of this world, yeah. and he's polished us, and he's cleaned us up. We were rejected, burned stones. Read that in Nehemiah 4, verse Verse 2. Amen. Amen. That's what we were. And the Lord's making us diamonds now. Hallelujah. He's making us jewels. Hallelujah. 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 He will make you that diamond that's been under so much pressure. Because the diamond is made under much pressure. I was ministering in Monaco. I was staying in Monaco, Monte Carlo, ministering, believe it or not. 
Many years I have been there. God opened the door for me. Katy Perry's mom asked to, if she could minister there. I tried to get her in over there. She's, she's a minister. Did you know that? Did you know Keith, Keith and Mary Hudson? And uh, I, was, I was staying with a family at that time. And uh, I had a dream, and I saw the lady of the house. They were really had going through a lot in their lives. And I saw her like a diamond that was being molded and shaped under much pressure because a diamond is only created under much pressure in the earth. Amen. Amen. And the next day I told her, I said, you know, I saw this about you. And uh, she's, when I went into the kitchen to sit down, there was a picture of a diamond on the wall. And I thought, well, that sounds like a confirmation. And then she said that was the name of her business. It was a diamond. I didn't know any of that. How many know God does things like that? Yes. And you're a diamond. Hallelujah. And he's going to make you a sharp point. Yes. I know I have that word for our brother in the back there. And uh, raise your hand. He knows who I'm talking about. And the Lord said, the Lord said, I'm making you a hammer. And I'm going to bust things up. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm going to use the word because he says in Jeremiah 23, is not my word like a hammer? Hallelujah. Yes. Hallelujah. Isn't it like a fire and like a hammer that breaks the rocks in pieces? Yes. And then I got also Isaiah 41, I think it's 15 for you, where he said, I will make you a new thrashing instrument having teeth, yes. and I will use you to thrash down the mountains and make them small. You're going to beat them small. You're going to beat down those hills, and the chaff will be blown away by the wind. Hallelujah. I said hallelujah. hallelujah. By the wind of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And there is a wind of the Holy Spirit. We thank you, Father, for miracles today, yes. for miracles, signs, and wonders, Lord, that we can believe that the same power that raised Jesus from the dead is the same resurrection power of the Holy Spirit that is present right here, right now. Say right now, right here. That power is still the same power. It's never diminished in power. It's never become less in power. It is still the same power of the Holy Spirit that actually brought Jesus of Nazareth back to life, Amen. conquered death, that the death grip of Satan had to let go, that death could not hold him in the grave. Hallelujah. And that same power is still here. It is still the power of the Holy Spirit that we can tap into, that we can begin to come into, that we can begin to tap down, get a tap root, get into it, begin to drill down until we hit that oil of the Holy Spirit. <laughs> Praise God. Oh! <laughs> Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. <laughs> Glory to God. Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Lord. Say it with me. Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Lord over the White House. Jesus is Lord over our nation. Jesus is Lord over this time right now in our lives over our homes, over our families, over our bodies, yes. over our finances. Yes. Jesus Christ, say it with me, Jesus Christ is Lord. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. And the Bible says every knee is going to bow Amen. and every tongue is going to confess. Amen. Every devil in hell is going to have to bow. Amen. Every evil person who's ever lived is going to have to bow to the name of Jesus. Amen. And every saint that's ever lived, any Christian who's ever lived, any born-again child of God is going to say, you are my Lord. Because the Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 that no man can say that Jesus is Lord but by the Holy Spirit. We can't even make him Lord unless we've had the Holy Spirit come into our lives. We have to be born again. Amen. 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 Going, going to church does not make you a Christian. You, you go to church because you're saved. Going to, make, going to McDonald's doesn't make you a hamburger. Amen. Amen. You heard that one. It's true. We have, we have to understand that we have to be born again, born of the Holy Spirit. A lot of people have a head knowledge. They say, oh, I believe there was a Jesus. I believe. Oh, yeah, I believe. Okay, leave me alone. I believe. No, it's more than just believing. It's receiving. 
You have to receive him in your heart. It's not enough to know there was a historical Jesus. It's not enough to believe there was a Jesus in history. You have to know him. I said you have to know him. Hallelujah. I pray that every one of you within the sound of my voice and those that are watching on, on social media will know Jesus personally. will have an encounter with Jesus Christ. Because he changed my life as a little boy and I've never been the same since. Amen. I strayed away from him when I was a teenager, but he brought me back. He brought me back. He's good. Isn't he good? How many know, how many know he's very patient? He's more patient than we could ever imagine. <laughs> so we need more of your patience, Lord. We need it right now. <laughs> we need your patience. Give me patience right now. You've heard that one. But we need it. We need it with ourselves and with one another because love is patient. Love is kind. 1 Corinthians 13. Amen. Today's message, go to Acts chapter 1. We're still going to stay in Acts chapter 1. And I've, I've received a lot from the Lord. And, and really the foundation for this entire message comes from T.L. Osborne's messages. And I want to give him credit where credit is due and honor to, to whom honor is due. And I thank the Lord for the opportunity to meet him, to, to be with him, to, to bring him to France. And it was, it was my idea, personally, only, to bring him to France. I brought him to France in 2006 with the help of many ministers. They said it was impossible for me to do that. I had asked him two other times in my travels in the con different countries with him if he would come to France because I was already going to France. Since the year 2001, I've been going to France. And I felt like he was supposed to go. He hadn't been there since the 1963 or some, something like that. And he came. God put it together. When I was with him in Tokyo, I asked him again. And before he left to go to the airport, he took my hands and he said, bring me to France. I thought, oh, man. <laughs> That's easy for you to say. I said to him before he got on the, he was going to get in a van. I said, uh, uh who do I talk to in France? He goes, go to the gypsies. They owe me a favor. I didn't know any gypsies. He says, I built churches for them in, in, in the south of France and in Spain. And I'm like, okay. So I, I actually was able to have it set up to meet the, the biggest gypsy president in the world, gypsy Christian president in the world. His name was Robert. He sat down like a godfather. And I ministered in their church. And you know what? They didn't do that much to help. You know who brought him to France with the help of the Holy Spirit? Was the Africans, the African people. I was in a prayer meeting with, with a brother, brother Brown, a Pastor Brown, who goes around the town. I used to tell him that. And uh, we had a prayer meeting, and he jumps up in the middle of the prayer meeting. He goes, we can do it. We can do it. Amen. And they, they raised 200,000 euros to bring him. And he speaks, he spoke fluent French. He had a video, did you know that? He was very, he was a great pianist. He spoke, he's a very smart man. But just to tell you, I want to thank, I want to thank the Lord again for his ministry because I've been, I've been Pentecostal. I was brought up Pentecostal and Baptist. I'm a Baptocostal. But then as I began to learn more about what God was doing in the latter rain movement, in the restoration movement with Glenn Foster, they used to call them uh, restoration movements. Then we went into the charismatic movement, which I don't know what thing it is now, but I know it's always been a Jesus movement. And God brought me back to that central theme more than ever before. And I'm staying there. I said, I'm staying there Amen. on the theme of Jesus Christ Amen. and him crucified. Paul said, I didn't know anything else among you in 1 Corinthians chapter 2. He said, I don't know anything else among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. And yes, we need to learn about the fivefold ministry, apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers, according to Ephesians 4.11. We need to understand the governmental body of the church. We need to understand that we're in a restoration movement. God is restoring everything the church lost. Amen. Amen. I believe in the latter rain movement, and where the latter rain is going to be greater than the former. Amen. And that the greatest revival that the church has ever seen is going to happen before Jesus returns again. It'll be double of what happened in the day of Pentecost. I talked to the old timers when I was a teenager who were there at Azusa Street. I actually got to meet witnesses, eyewitnesses of people that were there in 1906 when, they, when the Holy Spirit was poured out in Azusa Street. 
California, in Los Angeles, California. And they told me, and they prophesied it. They said, the greatest revival is coming. The, it will be greater glory than ever what the early church had. Amen. The greatest evangelism of souls is going to take place before Jesus returns. Amen. I'm going to say it again, before Jesus returns. Amen. You know who else said that? Smith Wigglesworth said that. Smith Wigglesworth. You need to look up these names. We need to do some homework. But Smith Wigglesworth was a great man of God. How many have heard of him? He prophesied it also to David Duplessy. Amen. He prophesied it to Lester Summerall. He prophesied it to different people that before Jesus would come back, that there would be a great movement. And, and David Duplessy, by the way, I got to meet him at Glenn Foster's church, and he was called Mr. Pentecost. I met him in 1980. And uh, he was used, he was prophesied by Smith Willisworth. He threw him against the wall, and he told him, <laughs> they were rough, he was rough, rough Englishman. And he said, you will be used to break the den denominational walls. And you will bring the charismatic movement into many, many different denominations and even into the Catholic Church. And it happened. It all happened. That's why they called him Mr. Pentecost. Okay? But you see, in this great movement that took place in 1906, there were great men of God and women of God, like Maria Woodworth Edder. They called her Mother Edder. Amen? There was John G. Lake, who became a great apostle of South Africa. There was all these people that were there. Uh, Sister Amy Simple McPherson was there. Did you know that? They were there in the outpouring. And God used them powerfully. F.F. F. Bosworth was there and his son, Robert Bosworth. Right. But F.F. F. F. Bosworth, Bosworth, how many have heard of Bosworth? And you need to get the book Christ the Healer. It's fantastic. And he's the one that God used as a spiritual father back in the 20s, 30s, and 40s. Even to William Branham, he was a spiritual father. T.L. Osborne was birthed in all that. At the same time that Israel was becoming a nation again, in 1948, the Holy Spirit was being poured out again in a new, fresh way up in Canada, in Saskatchewan, Canada. And Brother Perry that came here was actually there. <laughs> Praise God. Sister Maureen Gallardi was actually there. Have you ever heard of these names? She gave me a lot of her things before she went to, to Singapore. We used to have a lot of her, her little, in, uh, the Ten Commandments, and right there, the menorah, she gave me this. It's actually gold-plated. I didn't even know her that well. I know a brother over here made the, a lot of these things for her in the back. Our brother, Ken, made these things, but I didn't know her as well as you did. She called me. She came here once, and she said, I know God's hand is on your life. He's going to use you, and I'm going to give you. And she gave me also the Aaron's rod that budded, all these things. But did you make that too? Did you make this up here? You did? Wow, isn't that amazing? Let's give the Lord a hand for that. <laughs> that's, and that's an exact replica, by the way. <laughs> Praise the Lord. But today's message, I'm getting to it. Someone say amen. amen. Discovering supernatural living. Everybody say it with me. Discovering supernatural living. You know, I want to call it that so that we cannot have any problems with any censorship. Discovering supernatural living. And, you know, there was a, we did a Bible college here, International School of Ministry. I saw them for many years, and we all went to, 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 to uh, Israel one year. And um, one, of the, one of the teachers was A.L. Gill, who was a wonderful man of God. And he, and he actually did a series of teachings on supernatural living so i'm calling this discovering i didn't get it from him but i remember that discovering supernatural living god wants you to discover it you know it's a discovery i don't know about you but i'm still on a discovery with jesus i'm still discovering more and more and you know what we're never going to stop discovering there's so much to know there's so much to uncover there's so much to find out about when you discover something, it means you're finding something out you didn't know before. Did you know that God wants you to live a supernatural life? Amen. He wants you to live a supernatural lifestyle. That's what miracle life is all about. Amen. Miracle life was given by God through Jesus Christ for the whole world. And we're Miracle Life Church. And we won't be censored for that. We are Miracle Life Church because we believe that God is the miracle life. God is a life giver. He's a 
living God. Amen. How many believe he exists? He's, he, he's a living God. He's alive. Hallelujah. All the gods of this earth are idols, but the Lord made the heavens. Amen. And he gave to everyone life and breath and all things. He's the life giver. Hallelujah. And the Bible says in Acts 17, 28, that in him we live and move and have our being. And, and Paul said he made of one blood of all nations. You know that. Yep. Hallelujah. So we shouldn't have any gender problems. We shouldn't have any race problems because we're all one blood. Amen. Praise the Lord. Discovering supernatural living by discovering the kind of person God wants you to be. That's how you're going to find it. You know, God wants you to be a certain kind of person. He wants you to be a supernatural person. He wants you to understand that what is impossible with men is possible with God. You can live in the impossible. You can live in the realm of miracles. You can live in a realm of believing God. Why? Because Jesus is the same miracle worker when he walked the earth, when he walked on the water. Come on, when he turned the, the water into wine. Yes. Amen. When he multiplied the bread of, uh, and, and the loaves amen, of bread and fishes, he's still the same. He still raises the dead. He still opens up the blind eyes. He still opens up the deaf ears. He still causes the cripples to walk. He still heals every sickness and every disease. He heals cancer. Amen. Come on. Yes, amen. Whatever's wrong, he can heal it. Yes, doesn't matter how bad off the person is. doesn't matter if the doctors gave up, medical signs gave up. Jesus Hallelujah. can still heal. Jesus can still come at the last moment. We need to contend for the faith which was once and, all, and for all delivered to the saints. Jude 1, 3. Jude 1, 3. It's not in your notes. So you need to write this stuff down. Jude 1, 3. We need to contend. We need to fight for the, the faith that the Lord gave us. I remember when I had a ministry up in Wickenburg. Before I started the church here, I had a ministry up there, and I remember the Lord told me to say, let the faith of Jesus be manifested. As I began to pray for the sick, they were being healed, but it was because the Lord was saying, it's not your faith, it's my faith. I have been crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me, Galatians 2.20. We live by the faith, not just in the Son of God, but King James says it right. It's the faith of the Son of God. God gives you his faith. God will give you his ability to believe. God will give you faith that you don't have. We never have enough faith. And God wants you to discover the kind of person he wants you to be. And when you find that out, you're going to understand that he wants you to be a person who lives in miracle life. Yes. The miracle life of Jesus of Nazareth. The miracle life that he gave, that he walked in. And he wants us to continue what Jesus began. Yes. What Jesus began and what Jesus taught. He wants us to be his messengers. That's his teaching. To give out his truth and his word. He says, if you continue in my word, then are you my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Right? John 8, 31 and 32. He's going to make us free when we begin to have truth. Truth is powerful. Truth is God's knowledge. We need to have truth. If people are having problems because they don't have enough truth, Hosea 4, 6, my people are destroyed for the lack of knowledge. What knowledge? The knowledge of God. The knowledge that comes from him. When he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all the truth. Amen. John 13, 16. He will not speak of himself. Whatever he hears, he will speak and he will show you things to come. He will take the things that belong to me that I received of the Father. My inheritance that has been given to me as a son who receives from the Father. And he gives it unto you. Because now you're entering into his inheritance. You're entering into being a son and a daughter through Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Not just being a citizen of heaven. Not just being a member of a church. But being a child of God. Hallelujah. Being born of the Holy Spirit. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I say unto you, you must be born again. How can I be born again, Nick at night said, Nicodemus. Can I enter the second time my mother's womb and be born? And how do you know Jesus was shaking his head? 
<laughs> you're supposed to be a ruler of the Jews. You're supposed to be a teacher of the Jews. You're supposed to be educated. You're supposed to be a spiritual leader, and you don't even know these things? Yeah. Hallelujah. 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 He said, we know what we're talking about. We're speaking what we've seen and heard, but you don't receive our witness. Why? Because it doesn't come from the mind of man. Amen. It comes from the Holy Spirit. The things of the, of the Spirit are foolishness to the natural mind. Maybe today you think some of this is foolish, but to those that are saved, it is the power of God and salvation. Amen. 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 The preaching of the cross is foolishness to those that are perishing, right? Yeah. Is it Romans 1.17? But to those that are saved, it is the power of God. Hallelujah. How many know we got to preach the cross? Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Discovering supernatural living by discovering the kind of person God wants you to be so you can live the miracle life of Jesus and continue what he began and what he began to do and teach. In, in John 2, 11, this beginning of miracles. Everybody say miracles. miracles. We're talking about miracles. You can't, you can't separate Jesus from miracles. You can't separate the Holy Spirit from miracles. This beginning of miracles did Jesus in Cana of Galilee and manifested forth his glory. And his disciples believed in him, believed on him. That's where faith comes from. When we see the power of God in action, when we see the manifested healings take place when we see God do something that is miraculous, something beyond the norm. Amen? Amen. So what is a miracle? I'm glad you asked that question. See, we need to define what a miracle is. It said this beginning of miracles did Jesus. What did he do there? He turned the water into wine. Amen. That was a miracle. It says that was the beginning. He began to do these things. We're going to continue what he began. Amen. I said, we're going to finish what he started. Hallelujah. The book of Acts has never been completed because we're still writing it. Amen. Amen. Get ready. Get prepared. Yeah. Get geared up. Get equipped. Yep. Get mature. Get separated. Put away childish things. Yep. Get serious with the things of God. Be a diligent seeker after him. And you're going to start seeing his glory break through in your life. You're going to start seeing miracles like you've never seen before. Yeah. So, well, I haven't seen the things you're talking about. We have. We have because we've been paying the price. We've seen the lame walk. We've seen the dead raised. We've seen blind eyes open. We've seen deaf ears open. We've seen stage four cancers disappear for no apparent reason. Amen. There is no logical reason to a miracle. When a miracle takes place, there is no science that can back it up because it's above science. Amen. And God told me one day, he said, miracles happen because i'm a miracle god lives in the miraculous god is a miracle what is a miracle to be beyond i wrote down here and it's an abnormal occurrence no, it's not normal turn and tell somebody we're not normal. we're not normal see if you're a miracle life person the miracle life church you're not normal amen god doesn't want you to live a normal life how boring is that anyways god wants you to be an ordinary person with an extraordinary god he wants you to believe him for things you've never thought possible. In fact, you will not be able to believe him until you need to. Desperation usually has to be the case when we're desperate in our lives and we can't go any further. That's usually when God says, okay, you're a candidate for a miracle now. Amen. So what is a miracle? It's an abnormal occurrence that transcending above the course of nature. It's above nature not subject or bound to the natural laws of the physical world. It's not bound to it. It's not subject to it. And we are. And so our minds are always arguing with what a miracle is. We say, oh, no, I don't see nothing happening. I'm still sick. I still have pain. I still have problems. I don't have the answers to these things. I don't have the solutions. God says, I do. God says, I do. Jesus came and healed what? Those who couldn't be healed. Jesus came to cure those who were incurable. Yes. Amen. There were people dying of leprosy. And by the way, I met a minister that was healed of leprosy when I went to India. There's still places where leprosy still exists. And you know how he's, he got healed? He saw Jesus appear to him. That's when I saw the lame woman walk in his church. I said, somebody's joints are being healed. She got up and started walking. And I thought, well, he's not impressed because he was healed of leprosy. But they're quiet people. Indian <laughs> people are quiet people. And, you know, but, but these are happening. There's still leper colonies. Do you know that? There's still places. But Jesus touches the untouchable. You're not supposed to touch a leper. He said, heal the sick. Cleanse the lepers. Come on. 
Raise the dead. Freely you have received. Freely give. Heal the sick. Who said that? Jesus. Who is he talking to? You. Amen. Romans 10.8. Yes, amen. You. Say you. you. Point at somebody. You. <laughs> you. <laughs> Go ahead. It's all right to point. You heal the sick. So well, I need he healing. Well, you pray for others. God will heal you. Amen. Come on. Amen. Don't give up. Amen. amen. We're not giving up on you. I don't know how long you've been sick. That woman, it was 12 years with the issue of blood. The most famous story of healing in the New Testament, probably, right? right? Healed after 12 years, spent all her money on doctors. We don't know what kind of physicians they had back then. It must have been pretty brutal, right? Yeah. Probably a bunch of saws and hammers, and who knows what they used. But, uh, <laughs> but she was not made better. In fact, the Bible says she got worse. And she was on her last leg. It was her last chance. But Jesus... I said, but Jesus. Everybody say, but Jesus. But Jesus. Hallelujah. Turn and tell somebody, don't give up. Don't let go. Hold on. Believe God for something supernatural to happen in your life. What's supernatural above the natural? What is a miracle? It's not subject or bound to the natural laws of the physical world. That's why people don't want to hear about it. People don't want to hear about this. It's a sign and a wonder is what that means in the Greek. I took this out of the Greek, out of the word there, this beginning of miracles. I looked that up out of John 2, 11, and that's what it means. It means a sign or a token or a wonder that's indicating that God is moving. There's a divine happening taking place. Hallelujah. Supernatural divine acts of intervention. That means God's going to intervene. God's going to come into your life. And when we pray, we're not begging God to do something. We are ordering the kingdom of God to take place in the affairs of people's Amen. lives. Amen. Paul Bilheimer said that statement out of Destined for the Throne. You can't find it anymore, but you could get it on Amazon. Destined for the Throne. How many remember that? Paul Bilheimer. He was such a teacher, an intercessor. He said that... Prayer is not begging God to do something. Hallelujah. Amen? But actually prayer is decreeing and speaking the kingdom of God into the affairs of people's lives where the Holy Spirit will intervene. Hallelujah. How many need some intervention? Amen. How many need some intervention? <laughs> need someone to grab you and put you in a straitjacket? No. No, you don't need that. You need someone to come, the Holy Spirit, Amen. and receive you you as you are and take you as you are and clean you up and re take off that straight jacket. Come on. That's all the world can do. Amen. 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 I was actually challenged with that one time where someone was very mentally ill and the only way they could get help was to send a truck, a van down called Taros and have them put in a straight jacket. And I said, no, the family would get upset with that. See, God don't want to put you in a straight jacket. He wants to release you from all the jackets. So what is a miracle? Everybody say a sign. How many with signs and wonders? What's a wonder? It's when you wonder at it. What's wonderful? It's full of wonder. How many know his name is wonderful? That means you're going to, wow, wonder. I wonder what this is. God's always going to do that to your mind. So whenever you can't understand it, you're probably getting really close to a miracle taking place in your life when you don't understand it. Supernatural divine acts of intervention in the lives of everyday people. That's you and me. Amen. God wants to do something special for you. Hallelujah. 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 How many has been praying? Amen. Find out what's hindering that, that miracle. Find out what's keeping you back from that miracle. There is something that's not on God's part. It's not on God's part. Amen? Amen. You keep believing. Don't let go. God will give you the answer. Amen. God will give you the answer. Can I say it? Can you get, get an amen? Or can I get an amen? <laughs> In Acts 1, 1 through 5 in, in, your, in your Bible here is a seven principles from, from the word miracle. We're taking this from the teachings of T.L. Osborne, and I, I modified it as I saw fit and added my own revelation to it. But it says, The former treatise or account have I made with Theophilus of all that Jesus both began to do and teach. Amen? Until the day which he was taken up after that he through the Holy Ghost had given commandments unto the apostles whom he had chosen, to whom also he showed himself alive after his passion or death by many infallible proofs, being seen of them forty days and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God and being assembled together with them. He commanded them not that they should not depart from Jerusalem, 
but wait for the promise of the Father, which says he, you have heard of me. For John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. Amen. Not many days hence. Hallelujah. So we took the word miracle, and the word M there for miracle is Christ our model. He's our model, M for model. Amen. That means he's our example. Say, Christ is my example. How we see Jesus in our world. All that Jesus began to do and teach. We've got to get our eyes on Jesus, focus on Jesus. It's all about Jesus. Amen. 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 Follow his model and pick up his mantle. That's what we need to do. He's our model. He's our example. We're going to have to follow him as our example and take up our cross. Amen. And also take up the mantle he gives you. God has called you. God has put an anointing on your life. It's time for you to begin to pick up that mantle like Elijah threw his mantle, his garment down. Hallelujah. And mantle his jacket, right? He threw it down and, and Elisha picked it up and he hit the waters and he said, where is the spirit of the Lord God of Elijah? <laughs> well, Elijah was already taken up by a chariot up into heaven. But the spirit of Elijah was still here. And he's still here today. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And you got to pick it up. But see, if Elisha hadn't kept his eyes on the heavens, he would have never seen it. He said, if you if you can have the double portion of my anointing, if you see me when I'm taking up. See, we got to get our eyes on the Lord. Keep our eyes on the things above. Amen. Don't look at what people say about you. Don't look at what you think about yourself. Don't look at yourself. Don't look at others. Amen. Look at Jesus. Hallelujah. And then let our eye, Christ is our inspiration. Amen. He inspires us. He impacts us. Amen. Amen. How we see ourselves in him. Because now we're being inspired, hallelujah, with his desire. Until the day that he was taken up and he ascended up in the sky. The whole story is so unbelievable when you really stop and read it as if you never read it in your life. Read the story of Jesus. You have to believe in the supernatural to believe that it's really true. You really have to. That he was born of a virgin, right? Right? And then he ascended up in the sky. He was raised from the dead. When you really study it out, the only way you can believe this is really true is by believing in the miraculous. The whole life of Jesus is a miracle life. His entire life from his birth to his death to his resurrection to the time that he ascended, it says until the day he was taken up and they saw him. And I can't help but be more enthralled and more excited than ever before when I begin to realize the kind of faith that we're actually supposed to have, the kind of faith we're supposed to believe in, the kind of things that we're supposed to believe that this actually happened. Take it away. Get away from the religious ideologies out there and all the religious traditions of man. And, and don't look at Jesus through a stained glass window, but see him as the brilliant, dazzling yeah. son of the living God, shining in the power that is brighter than the sun at noonday. Hallelujah. Yeah. Can you say hallelujah? hallelujah? We must be inspired with his desire. He inspires us. He motivates us. He's the one that makes us want to be like him. And then R is our response to his call, to his mandate, his choice of us. That's his call on your life. We say, well, you know, I accepted the Lord. No, he accepted you. Amen. Well, I was seeking the Lord. No, he was seeking you before you ever sought him. That's Christianity. He was looking for you long before you even knew he existed. Amen. And he's after you. Amen. And he's Amen. called you. He said, you didn't choo choose me. I chose you. So it's his choice. We have to respond to his choice. Say, okay, Lord, you've chosen me. I get it. You know, you, your hand is upon me. I want to respond properly to what you want me to do. It's how we see ourselves in our world. We have to see how, we, how God is going to use us. Amen. After he had given commandments, which means a charge or a mandate to the apostles he had chosen. You see, that, that mandate is what you've been called to. God's got you a date with you. Amen. It should be called a God date instead of a mandate. It's a mandate with a God date. God has a divine appointment with you. God wants a date with you. God wants you to spend time with him. God wants you to seek after him. God wants you to get to know him. Yes. Christianity is not just knowing about him. It's knowing him. What's that mean? You're experiencing him. You're encountering him. You're talking from experience. 
When you talk from experience, nobody can take it away from you. Because your faith is deeper than all the unbelief of the world. You have a greater revelation personally of him. It doesn't matter if nobody believed, and it didn't matter if everybody believed. It doesn't matter either way. It doesn't matter whether you're healed or not. You still believe that Jesus is the healer. You still believe that he's the same yesterday, today, forever. Whether you received it or not, it has nothing to do with it. Your faith has nothing to do with the, with the visible evidence. The visible evidence will take place called a miracle because you're looking to him. He's already revealing himself to you. The problem is we have a generation of Christians that don't even, don't even know him. They don't understand him. They don't know the Holy Spirit. The Lord says there's an epidemic of shallowness where people don't know the Holy Spirit in this hour. They really don't. So how can you tell somebody about somebody they don't know? You could talk about it till you're blue in the face, but unless you really have a personal encounter with the Holy Spirit of Jesus, you don't know what I'm talking about. You don't know what sanctification is. Because our response is our responsibility, our ability to respond, our response slash ability to Him. What does that mean? I'm going to respond to this call by setting myself apart to Him. I'm going to repent and turn away from my sin and live me for myself, and I'm going to give my life to Him. That's my response to His call. That's my response ability, that I've got to do something with my lazy flesh. i got to do something with my selfish flesh. i got to start saying, no, i got to serve him. i got to respond to his love. I love him because he first loved me. 1 John 4, 19. I love him because he first, that's my response. My love is a response to his love. My faith is a response to his faith. It's his faith in me that now I can have faith in him because he believed in me. Before I was even in the belly, he knew me. He called me. Hallelujah. And when I'm set apart, that means I'm going to take my life and I'm going to say, I'm going to go to church. Some people don't go to church. I keep telling people, go to church. Well, there's no church to go to. God will help you find a church you're supposed to go to. Hey, there's a good one called Miracle Life Church. (laughs) No, there's good churches. But you got it. You got to go to church. Why? Why do you think it's so hard to go to church? (laughs) If it was easy, then it probably was your flesh. You know, it's hard to make a commitment. It's hard to say, I'm going to take time and I'm going to go to the house of God. That takes an unselfish attitude and that's called being set apart. That means you're putting God first in your life. And I'm telling you, when I start becoming a churchgoer, when I start becoming dedicated, then I start getting involved helping a pastor with a new church over in Glendora, California. The devil got off my back, Jack. I like to run. Hey, he was on my back all the time. I was constantly having magic mountain Christianity, roller coaster Christianity, up one day and down the next. Whoa, way up here in the highs and all the next damn really low, and all really high again. I got tired of it. I said, what's the matter with me? God says, you got to find a church. I said, God, there's no churches. <laughs> I said, there's no churches where I live. You know, I lived in the Los Angeles area. He said, well, you got to find a church. I said, well, there's Church on the Way. I remember that one, Jack Hayford back then, back in California. But Church on the Way was Church out of the way. It was like an hour and a half, two hours to go there. And I thought, I'm not going to, I can't go there. I went one time and met him and saw Pat Boone with white shoes on. (laughs) There's a lot of celebrities used to go to that church. But God says, you got to find a church. You got to pray for a church. And I did. I obeyed the Lord. I found a church. I became dedicated in that church. I became the first elder in that church. And from that church, I was launched out into Arizona. And God's plan and purposes start falling into place in my life because I made a commitment. And you know what? The devil got off my back, and I started getting strong, and I started becoming like Popeye. I was eating my Holy Ghost spinach. And that that Pluto, whatever his name was, was getting off my back. I'm serious. I mean, it's a wonderful place to be in when you get strong in the Lord. It's a wonderful place when you don't backslide, when you're not being moved, when you're not being shaken, when you can stand fast in the liberty when Christ has made you free. When you get to that place, it's a wonderful place to be. That's when God says, now I can use you. 
now I can use you. I can't use you when you're always up and down and all around and merry go Christianity, merry go round, you know, will of fortune, you don't know where it's going to stop. And he's not even doing it anymore. But, um, you know, it's, it's real important that we make a commitment to the house of the Lord. Psalm 92, 13, those that will be planted in the house of the Lord shall flourish in the courts of our God. you you, you got to be planted. You don't see a tree walking around. Well, I'm going to try this church, that church, this church. No, get planted where you are. You're going to bloom where you're planted. Amen. You're going to bloom where you're planted. You say, well, I don't see any fruit. Just stay put. God says you're going to bear much fruit. Amen. Amen. And then letter A, awaken to action as his delegates. That's what I was trying to get to today. Praise the Lord. Awaken to action as his delegates. How many of you are a delegate? What's a delegate? That means God gives you his authority. He's deputizing you. Come on, he's giving, you, he's giving you the deputy. Hallelujah. Amen. You say, I'm God's deputy. <laughs> say, I have his authority. God is awakening me. A for action. He's awakening me to action as his delegate. That means his faith in us. God's plan depends on me. When you understand that, when you have a revelation, discover that God's plan depends on you. Did you know that? God's plan. He says, I'm not doing anything without the body. I'm not doing anything without you. Amen. When you start really realizing that, you'll start getting busy for Jesus, speaking those things pertaining to the kingdom of God. Jesus spent 40 days before he ascended talking about what? The things pertaining to the kingdom. Why? Because he says, I'm going to use you now. I'm already going to heaven. Now you're going to stay here, and I'm going to give you my authority. I'm giving you my kingdom power. You're going to begin to demonstrate it. You're going to begin to enforce it. You're going to cast out those devils. You're going to cast out that darkness. You're going to let the light shine. You're going to see sicknesses and diseases completely eliminated. Come on. Mental illness eliminated. Emotional problems eliminated. Hallelujah. Physical problems disappearing because of the power of God. Amen. And then C is the credibility of the gospel. That's miracles make our witness believable. See, miracles, God gives miracles to bear witness. The Bible says in Acts 4.33, and with great power, the apostles gave witness to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. Say, great grace. Great grace is upon me because I'm a witness of his resurrection because of his great power. God wants to give you great power in your life. Amen? And then L... Showed himself alive after his passion by many infallible proofs and L's the legality of our faith. It's his miracle life succeeding in our world. Amen. We have to understand the legal grounds, like we sang that song, this grace and where I stand. Amen? It'll, it'll hold me to the end. The grace of God is what we're walking in. We don't deserve anything. It's all by his grace. Why? Because Jesus paid the price. Everybody say, Jesus paid the price. It's his miracle life that is succeeding it's going to accomplish that which it set out to do. That's success. When you, when you get past the finish line. Can you say amen? amen? There's no Pentecost without Calvary. Amen. Without the cross, there is no outpouring of the Spirit. Amen. You couldn't have Pentecost in Acts 2 until you had Calvary. Until Jesus bled and died on that cross. Amen? amen? So we have to wait for the promise of the Father, Jesus said amen. in verse 4 there. That's the waiting for the legality of what's going to take place. How many know that you can legally receive? Because Jesus paid the price. Say, I can legally receive. receive. Y'all had enough preaching already? Yeah. And then letter E is the last one. I know. I'm not even done yet. I got another page. Look at that. The, The experience of his power. How many God wants you to experience? E, experience his power or energy, the energy and the power of God in your life. All of us can receive. Because Jesus paid for it. Jesus paid for our sins. He was punished for our sins. He paid so we can be free from sickness and disease. Can you say amen? amen. And w- say this with me. With his stripes, with his stripes we, are we are healed. So the experience of his power is how Jesus ministers his supernatural power through us. Say supernatural. supernatural. Above the natural. Above, Above and beyond. Amen. What I can ask or think. And he said, you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Can you say amen? Amen. 
He said, John truly baptized you with water, Acts 1.5. John truly baptized you with water. So a lot of people have been baptized with water. A lot of Christians have been baptized in water. But you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Oh, yeah, John baptized with water. A lot of people stay right there, and that's all. But there's something beyond being born again. It's being baptized. You shall be baptized in the Holy Spirit. (laughs) Immersed, marinated, pickled in the Holy Spirit. So you become exactly like the very thing that you're being baptized into. It comes from dyeing a garment. It means when you dye a garment into a red dye, you can't tell the difference from the garment from the dye. When God's going to baptize you in his spirit, you're going to become the very thing that's baptizing you. Can you say amen? amen. And I guess I'll get to the next page tomorrow, <laughs> next week. Praise God. Well, actually, I can't because our brother is coming. How about if I read this in five minutes? Okay. Okay. A for awakening to action as his delegates. Number one, what happens when you discover how much God trusts you? Did you know God trusts you? It's not how much we trust God. It's how much he trusts you. He's going to entrust you. You know what that's going to happen when we understand and we discover how much God wants to trust us and wants to believe in us and wants to use us? It'll motivate us to action. 2 Timothy 1, 5, and 6. I'm calling up memories of your unfeigned, sincere faith. Unfeigned means not plastic, not fake. That means it's not one way one day and something different the next day. It's sincere, genuine faith that first lived in your grandmother, Lois, and then in your mother, Eunice, and now I'm persuaded dwells in you also. Isn't that? That's why I would remind you to stir up and awaken to action and keep burning the gift of God, that inner fire that is in you by the laying on of my hands. You got to read verse 5 before verse 6 there because he's saying you have this faith. It was imparted to you. It's a living faith. It's a vibrant faith. It's real. It works. It's powerful. And it was in your mother and it was in your grandmother. Hallelujah. That means there's impartations. When you've been under the spout where the glory comes out, God's Spirit's going to come down upon you. He's going to make you a mountain mover, a history maker, an earth shaker. And you'll start seeing miracles. You'll start filling those valleys and bringing down those hills. You're going to call those crooked ways to be straightened out in Jesus' name. Number two, what happens when you discover God's plan depends on you? Did you know God's plan depends on you? Some say, "Uh uh-oh. That's right. God's plan depends on you. That's the way God set it up. Jesus said, without me, you could do nothing. John 15, 5. But actually, he needs us too. The branch cannot, the vine needs the branch to bear the fruit. What happens when you discover God's plan depends on you? John 14, 12. He who believes in me, the works that I do, shall he do also. Verse 14 says, if you ask anything, 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 anything in my name, I will. I like the I wills. I will. Who? God, Jesus. I will do it. Who's going to do it? You? No, he's going to do it through you. (laughs) How's he going to do it through you? Because you're asking for the very impossible. Anything means anything. That means it doesn't matter what it is, how impossible it is, how crazy it is, how it could never happen. It's going to happen because God says if I said it, that's going to happen. Whatever God says will happen. Whatever God says will take place. Aren't you excited? For every word that God speaks has a power within itself to fulfill itself. The seed, we're seed planters. We're going to plant that seed. It's going to bear fruit. Luke 137 says that in the Greek. Every word that God speaks has the power within itself to fulfill itself. Just speak his word. Believe his word. You're going to see God's action. He goes, I will do it. He that believes in me, the works that I do, shall he do also. How many believes in him? How many believing into him? Number three, the anointing is on you to brag. 
not about yourself, but that Jesus is the star. When we make Jesus the star, we're going to see it will always work. Things will always work out. Things will always happen. Don't be, don't do more things because someone brags on you and don't do less because someone criticizes you. Do what you do because it's the work he wants done and he's depending on you to let him work with you to accomplish it. God's depending on you. Turn and tell somebody, God's depending on you. Yes, you. You can't hide in the corner. God's taking away the shell. No more turtle shells. No more hiding places. You're coming out of your shell. It's a grand opening. The balloons are flying. The banners are flying. It's a grand opening. You're coming out. You're coming out. God's going to use you because you're being awakened to action. Number four, I'm going to get done. Two more minutes, three minutes, four minutes. Okay. Stick to the simple message. Stick to the simple message. We could preach on all these things, but stick to the simple message of the gospel. Come on, somebody, help me. Amen. Say amen. Say hallelujah. Amen. You got to stick to the simple message. It's not another message. There's no new message. We don't need something new. We don't need all this baloney going around. We don't need it. There's a lot of stuff being preached. It's not from God. It's just baloney. That's a nice way of saying things. No. We have to stick to the simple message of the gospel. Well, I don't know what to preach. I remember that one sister called me up from Africa. I'm not going to tell you who she was. But she said, uh, Pastor, can you give me some advice? What do I preach? I said, preach Jesus. She goes, oh, thank you. <laughs> and she preached Jesus and saw Jesus move. Amen. Preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. What is the gospel? There's four things to the gospel. God's creation. Say God's creation. Satan's deception. That was the fall, right? Christ's substitution on the cross in our restoration. That's new life. God made us beautiful in his image. Satan deceived us and we fell. Jesus assumed all of our guilt and punishment. He redeemed us by his blood and gave us new life, a miracle life in a son and a daughter relationship with God himself. That's the message in a nutshell. That's the message of the gospel. <laughs> Number five, we are seed planters, like farmers, spreading the gospel of Jesus. You know you're planting seeds everywhere you go. <coughs> Amen. Luke 5, 15 and 17, but the news about him was spread farther, and large crowds kept gathering to hear him and be healed of their, in, of their illnesses. So we got to spread the word. Amen. And what happened? Large crowds gathered to what? To hear him, the truth, and to be healed of everything Jesus began to do and teach. God wants to heal you of your illness. God wants to heal you. God wants you to believe for the miraculous. And the power of the Lord was with him to heal, it says in the Greek. The word presence not even there in the original language. The power of the Lord was with who? Jesus. Wherever Jesus is, there's the power of healing. Whenever we put our faith in Jesus, we're going to see miracles and healing and supernatural provision. How many need some supernatural provision for your vision? There's two prayers God will never answer. Two prayers God will never answer. Number one, when you ask God to do something, he's already done. He said, no, I've already done that. It is finished. I've already done it. So God's not going to do something he's already done. We've got to find out what he's already done. Come on, we don't need to pray for more power. We need to pray for God to show us the power that's already been given to us. Everything is past tense. Everybody say past tense. Everything's already happened. And we could talk more about this, but God's never going to answer that prayer. When you tell him to do something, he's already done. So we've got to find out what he's already done. Amen. Number two, God's not going to answer this prayer. When you ask God to do something, he's telling you to do. Amen. Come on, stand up with me, everybody. If you can't stand, we'll pray for your healing. In Jesus' name, be healed right now. Amen. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Come on. God's not going to answer that prayer when you ask him to do something he's telling you to do. It's your turn. Turn, tell somebody, it's your turn. Touch them on the shoulder. It's your turn. It's your turn to get busy. It's, turn, it's your turn to pray for somebody. Amen. Put your hand on the one next to you on the right shoulder and begin to pray for them right now. We're going to activate you to action. We're waking you to action. In Jesus' name, find someone to pray with.